the Obama years, we've watched the U.S. engage in conflict overseas without authorization from Congress. How was Obama able to bypass that in a way that it doesn't apply to Trump in this case, in a way that you say that what he did is in violation of U.S. and international law? Well, Obama used the rationale that Congress had given Bush an authorization for the use of military force in 2001, but that only covered people who had supported the September 11th attacks. And in fact, Obama was, was not relying properly on that authorization for the use of military force either. But it's even more attenuated with Trump, because even if you were to argue that al Qaeda is related to ISIS, Trump's missile attack in Syria had nothing to do with ISIS. It was a missile attack against a sovereign government, and that was the government of Bashar al-Assad. And under the United Nations Charter, there is a prohibition against using military force except in self-defense or when permitted by the Security Council. This was not done in self-defense because Assad had not attacked any other country, and it was not sanctioned by the Security Council. So it violates the UN Charter, and it also violates the United, Na the United States War Powers Resolution, which only allows a president to introduce U.S. troops into hostilities or participate in hostilities in another country. Mm -hmm. If Congress has declared war, which is not the case here, if there is a congressional authorization, which there is not here because the authorization for the use of military force didn't from 2001 did not cover this situation. Um, and the only other time is when there's an attack on U.S. forces, and that had not happened either. So under both U.S. and international law, Trump's missile strike in Syria violated the law. If we look at the War Powers Resolution, does it change anything because there's no ground combat? Does that make a difference there? No, no, because we're still introducing U.S. forces into hostilities by, by initiating the, the bombing. So, no, that still violates the War Powers Resolution. Now, as a practical matter, Congress probably would give um, Trump authorization because there is so much positive feedback that he has gotten among members of Congress, among the corporate media, um, and, uh, and, and many other sectors of the U.S. society, um, that chances are Congress would authorize it, but it has not been authorized, and nevertheless, it still violates the U.N. Mm -hmm. Charter. He did notify Congress of the attack on Syria, and there are a few voices it, on Capitol Hill that say that he needs to come to Congress with a plan, that he needs to receive authorization. But there's actually a lot of other congressional members who told him point blank to bypass Congress and just do this himself without asking Congress. What do you make of that? Well, under the War Powers Resolution, um, assuming that it's a proper use of U.S. force, which it isn't, but if it was, he has, the president has 60 days to tell Congress about it, and then Congress has to either give him the thumbs up or the thumbs down. So he did comply with that part of the War Powers Resolution by informing Congress two days later that he had, um, that he had mounted this strike. But as, as a practical matter, um, when U.S. presidents are bombing people in other countries, um, there is very little pushback in the United States. Unfortunately, there are a few members of Congress, there's the alternative media, there are people on the left that, um, that are opposed, but this, this is, is reminiscent of 2003 before George W. Bush went in and changed the regime in Iraq, saying that there were weapons of mass destruction, which we all know there were not. Now, mm -hmm. there were a lot of people in the streets, 11 million people around the world in 2003 in February, um, trying to stop it, but that's, that opposition was not sustained. And now, of course, everybody um, says that that was a mistake to go into Iraq, and the U.S. is still in Iraq killing people, and in Syria, and in Yemen, and in Somalia. And you mentioned that this strike was in violation of international law. Do you imagine the U.N. is going to follow up on this at all? Well, the problem in the U.N. is the Security Council has the, the five permanent members have a veto. And we saw Russia veto a resolution today, which we heard early in your broadcast. Um, if there was If there was a resolution presented in the Security Council to condemn Donald Trump for his illegal bombing of Syria, the U.S. would veto it. Mm. So it would not 
but there is the Uniting for Peace resolution, which says that if the Security Council is unwilling or unable to restore international peace and security, then the General Assembly can do that. And the General Assembly is the democratic body of the UN, one country, one vote. Now, that is something that many of us have talked about in the past, but the United States blackmails smaller countries frequently into not um, voting against the United States. Did that with Yemen um, in uh, in 1991. We have less than a minute. I just want to get to this really quick. It, it does seem like Trump is more willing to act unilaterally in a show of force against countries like Syria. North Korea is another one. He tweeted, North Korea is looking for trouble. If China decides to help, that would be great. If not, we will solve the problem without them. Is, is he talking about a preemptive strike on North Korea? What would that mean? 30 seconds, please. There has been talk of a preemptive strike against North Korea. Preemptive strike is highly illegal, violates the UN Charter, is not done in self-defense um, The security unless the Security Council agrees. That would be a not only a violation of international law and U.S. law, but also would be extremely dangerous because North Korea has nuclear weapons and it would be it would be terrifying. And unfortunately, Trump is doing a lot of terrifying things. Um, we need to demand that he allow Syrian refugees into the country, that he, um, he um, give money to the UN for the humanitarian catastrophe, and that he work with Russia toward a diplomatic and political solution and a ceasefire in Syria. We'll leave it there. Thomas Jefferson School of Law professor Marjorie Cohen, thank you so much for coming on. We appreciate it. Thank you, Simone.